All right. So um, there was a question about what, what first order was. We talked about that. So you should have seen, you're supposed to learn first order circuits in uh, circuits one. So we're going to talk about that. What the heck does it mean to be a DC source? What does it mean to be a DC source? Somebody, direct current. Somebody was going to say direct current. That's right. Uh, what's it? So what's that? So direct current, the other one is alternating current, right? AC. But if I had to describe it, if you had to describe it to, to your mom, what, what does DC mean, right? What would it mean? Just real simple terms. Constant. Doesn't change over time, right? It's just basically a flat value. A battery is a DC source, right? Um, an AC source changes with time. All right, it, it has some kind of a fluctuation. And those are really pretty common, all right? So we, I'll break them down into the two types. Circuits one was all about DC sources. Circuits two is not entirely about AC sources, but it's the main thing that we cover, okay? Um, AC sources, the most common ones that we deal with are sines and cosines, okay? In part, because as it turns out, there's a special mathematical thing, any, any periodic waveform that exists in the world, can be thought of as a sum of sine waves. All right, so we can use that terminology. But these happen all the time. If I looked at the at the power coming out of the wall socket, if I looked at what it looked like, it looks sinusoidal, all right? So there's there's a whole reason, and if, if you study radio stuff, you study audio stuff, any of that, you know, you get into, AC, into basically sinusoidal things, all right? Digital systems, all right, if you're a computer engineer, DC is really all you have to deal with. All right, there's basically, you know, five volt sources, 3.3 volt sources, 1.8 volt sources. They're constants, okay? Now, DC circuits are pretty uninteresting in general, all right? Because not a whole lot can happen to them, all right? But the thing that you guys learned about at the very end of circuits one was when you have stuff like capacitors and inductors, okay? All right, one thing that we will spend a lot of time talking about in this class is I know that nobody in here yet is an expert on circuit analysis, all right? Circuit analysis is very simple in my view. You guys are gonna, you guys are gonna tell me all the time that you think the answer is this. There's no thinking in this class. There's only doing, no thinking. Why? Because there's only three things to circuits, right? What are the three things that exist in circuits? Well, voltage, current, resistance. Those those are the three variables that we talk about, right? And that's and that's good. The three and the, and there's basically three laws that relate those things, right? So one of them is Ohm's law, right? What are the other two? Yeah, basically KVL and KCL, Kirchhoff's voltage law and Kirchhoff's current law. That's it. That's the whole thing. There's a bunch of formulas that you guys are going to say you need to memorize. You don't need to memorize any formulas, all right? If you know those three things, you know everything. Okay. All right, and we're gonna we're gonna focus on that. And the other important thing I need to remember is this whole idea of the passive sign convention. Right? So, because it really what what circuits comes down to is taking the time to write down what those equations are for the circuit, and making sure that they're consistent with what you drew in the picture. That's all it really is. Okay. So when I look at the pictures that I have here, and I follow the passive sign convention, how do I write for this guy? VR1, how do I write that in terms of the resistor and that IR1 that I drew? Uh, well, yeah, so V equals, let's say I want to write it as V equals an I times an R. Is this a positive here? Positive. This is positive. Why is it positive? It's measuring the positive side. It's, it, yeah, the, the arrow is flowing into the plus terminal. So this is IR1 times R, all right? Now you guys, some of you guys are like, oh, this is too basic, all right? I guarantee you're all gonna screw this up at some point, right? If I have this guy right here, how do I write it? The arrow's going into the negative terminal, yeah. Yeah, negative IR2. Right? Yep, negative IR2. Okay, just like that. All right, that's real important. I'm always gonna try to focus on remembering that before I go through and try to finish anything. Okay. All right. That's, that's our basic rule that we need to remember. All right. Now, um, in going through any of these things, we're going to talk about this idea of steady state versus transient solutions. Okay. Um, what's it mean to have a steady state? What is a steady state? What does that mean? Yeah. There's no, uh, current flow. Everything's, uh, electronic. There, there, there may be a current flow. 
All right. Um, it all depends on the type of circuit that I'm looking at. All right. There's a circuit with capacitors or may not be. Yeah. The, so the, I guess the analysis is the same independent of time. Okay, that's the way I think about it. Yeah, the analysis is the same independent of time, right? So basically, if you guys learned about capacitors and inductors, hopefully, all right? And so what's what's true about a capacitor? So basically, the things that you should know, you should know resistors, you should know capacitors, and you should know inductors. And each one of them has their own kind of Ohm's law relationship. Okay, and we're going to review those. Now, the one that you know is basically, this one is V equals... IR, right? Now there's one for the capacitor and one for the inductor too, right? But before we go any further, what's the difference? Like if I was a physics guy and I want to say, what's the difference between the resistor, the capacitor, and the inductor? I'll put the capacitor and inductor in one bucket and I'll put the resistor in another bucket, right? What is it? What's special about that bucket? It, yeah, the currents and voltages are going to depend on time. Why do they depend on time? What do these things do? Charge. Well, yeah, I mean, so it's, they they charge up, they discharge, they do different things. What what it fundamentally? What's different between what a resistor does and what a capacitor does? Real, real basic level. Well, there's current current can flow through a resistor a capacitor over time. One of them stores energy. Yeah, I heard that. So so basically. These two guys store energy over here. Everything you guys said was correct, right? All right, you guys all had good answers with that. But basically, the the resistor is just is, he he is a user. He's he dissipates energy. All right, he's a light bulb in the world, right? He basically just heats up. Okay, this guy uses energy. Okay, this guy these two store energy. All right. Basically, what, what that kind of means is these guys have what we call memory. All right. They remember the past, which is why there is this dependence on time that happens with them. Okay. So when I talked about in, in circuits one, 2111, you guys had circuits like this. All right. If I wanted to, first of all, that circuit right there, where I have R1, R2, and V in in series with each other, what kind of circuit is that? What name would I give this guy? What's that? Series. Yeah, I call it series circuit. R1 and R2 are in series with that guy. And I call this a, a certain kind of divider too, wouldn't I? What kind of divider? Is it a current divider or voltage divider? Voltage divider, right? Because these resistors are going to divide down that voltage to some lower level. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So um, I'd call this a static circuit, right? Static meaning that at and as soon as I built this circuit, the currents and voltages would all be in steady state. They would all get to their final value. There's no changes that would happen in this circuit from T equal to zero onward until I, until I broke it. All the voltages and currents would be the same, all right? That's not the true, this not, that's not true. They, everything wouldn't be the same if I was looking at this guy here, okay? Now I've got this RC circuit and this is probably the kind of thing that you saw in circuits one, right? In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if the only thing you saw in circuits one was this guy with a resistor and a capacitor in series with each other. All right, this is a pretty common device. And I used this example right here, this picture here, it's a DRAM cell, okay? So it's a RAM cell. What's RAM mean? Random access memory. Random access memory, okay? So it's a, it's a memory device, right? And actually this circuit, and that circuit, sort of the same, okay? Actually, this, this upper picture here is just a model for this, okay? This thing here is called a transistor. You don't know what that is. I mean, you know, you've heard of it before, right? But you don't necessarily know what it is. What it is, it's a switch, right? I basically, I, I, apply, I apply a voltage to a control terminal, which is just like the little switch on the wall. I tell it to turn on, and it makes a connection between here and here, all right? And what do I do? I basically put a voltage onto a capacitor. If I had a voltage on a capacitor, like in, in this particular case, like if I close this switch in this picture up top right here, if I close this switch, what's going to happen to the capacitor over time? It's going to charge up. All right. Now, let's say this was a five volt source right here. If I waited long enough, what would be the voltage on the capacitor? Five 
Five volts. Five volts. Okay. All right. We're going to go over lots of problems on that if you don't see that, but hopefully you see that. Over time, it's going to become five volts. Okay. If I then open the switch, what's going to be the voltage on the capacitor after I open up the switch? Well, so let's say I let it charge all the way up. Let's say this guy got all the way up to five volts, and then I opened the switch. Five volts. It would be five volts. Right? There's no place for the charge to leave that capacitor. That's a memory device. So if you look at what's in a RAM cell, it's capacitors. Okay. So it's it's got memory. It stores and, and it allows us to remember stuff. All right. So it's pretty useful. Now the thing about this is the currents and voltages in these circuits change over time. They always become constant. In other words, they always become flat, but they do change over time and they have these exponential looks to them, right? So in this circuit, nothing exponential about it. At time t equal to zero and time t equal to infinity, all the currents, all the voltages are all the same, okay? Not true here, all right? This guy has a transient pathway where he gets from wherever he starts to wherever he ends, okay? So that's that's what we, we you know, when we talk about DC cir circuits, when I talk about first order circuits, what is it, why do I call this thing a first order circuit? It has one storage component, that's right, all right? Um, if it has two storage components, then it's second order. Basically what that means is that it's gonna have a differential equation and there's gonna end up being one exponential in that response, okay? If I had a second order circuit, there'd be two storage elements and how many exponentials would I have? Two, all right? And we only really deal with first order and second order. And we're not dealing with second order yet. We'll get there, but we're going to deal with first order first. Okay. All right. So there's a lot we can say here. I don't want to get too lost in the weeds. I want to get into some examples pretty quickly. All right. So I want to remember the relationships. So for capacitors and inductors. So I've got my capacitor here. All right. I say here's V sub C and here's I sub C. What's the relationship there between those? IC equals what? I remember. C, DV, C, D, T. Okay. Now, what would I have written if I had it going that way? Negative C, D, V, D, T. Okay. All the passive sign convention stuff still applies, okay? And we're gonna see lots of examples of that, okay? Now, what's the stored energy? So I, they, we usually write energy uh, with a W. And the reason for that is because work and energy are the same thing. Right? We don't need to get too lost in that. It's not something we're gonna talk about a lot. How do we write, what's the energy stored in the capacitor? What's the formula for that? Wait, one half CV squared. It sure is, one half CV squared. Okay. Now, what about for the inductor? So I'll write it the same way. Here's VL. Here's IL. Okay. How would I write that? What's the relationship there? Yeah, it's yeah, L V L equals L D I L by DT. So basically we say a capacitor stores um, charge, and that charge is related to the voltage. What's an inductor store? Magnetic field is what it stores, right? And and so that's defined in terms of the current, right? So the energy, what's the relationship there for the energy in the inductor? How do I write that? I know even if you didn't see it in 2111, you saw it in physics too. Yep. One half L I squared. One half L I squared. All right, like that. Okay. All right. So that's that's our core set of relationships here. All right. So these relationships will tell me everything I need to know, but I, I want to basically think about there's I said there's two conditions. There's the transient piece and the steady state piece. The steady state piece is after everything's become constant. Okay. What I know in these in these things is the voltages and currents will always become constant. The changes stop, everything becomes constant after a while. 
All right. <clears throat> so if I think about this, IC equals CDVDT for a capacitor. Okay. If I wait long enough, V sub C will become constant. What value it becomes depends on the circuit. All right. The value it becomes depends on the circuit, but it's always going to become constant. What's that mean about I sub C? Yeah. It's going to become zero, right? Because I'm taking C times the derivative of a constant. The derivative of a constant is always zero. Okay. So I sub C will always become zero. So what that says is that I have in steady state, the capacitor, right? Which I'll write like this. Here's V sub C, here's I C. In steady state, he looks like this. He looks like that. There's a voltage across it, but no current through it. It's an open circuit. A device that can have a voltage across it, but no current through it's an open circuit. Okay. So what about for an inductor? Well, I sub L will become constant. Again, I don't know what it'll become. It'll become something, right? The circuit will tell me what it will become. V sub L will become zero. I forgot to delete that, okay? Um, why do I know it's going to become zero? Because what's true? If V equals L di dt, if I is constant, what's V got to be? Zero. Okay, so what's that tell me about the inductor in steady state? So if the inductor is, here's V sub L, oops, V sub L, I sub L. In steady state, if the voltage is zero, but the current is something, what kind of circuit element can have a current, but no voltage? Short circuit, all right? So in steady state, he basically becomes this. Here's V L, here's I L. So when we do our analysis in steady state, what we do is we replace the inductor with a short and we replace the capacitor with an open, all right? And then when we do our analysis in the transient piece, we got to figure out what's the circuit that's involved, okay? All right, so we're going to do some examples with that. Now, the other thing that's really important for us is energy is neither created nor destroyed, okay? So one of the examples I can always think of with this, energy is always... Energy always has to remain constant, okay? So if I have a certain amount of energy uh, at a given time, that energy has to be continuous over time, all right? So it, for, for example, right? So if I have a car moving down the road and the car runs into a wall, right? How much energy is in a car as it's driving? Let's say a car is driving 70 miles an hour. How much energy is in that car? A lot, a lot. okay. Mm -hmm. how, how could I figure out a lot? actually not that hard. It's actually really similar to this one half CV squared, one half LI squared. How much energy is in a car? Yeah, one half, one half MV squared. So one half the mass times the velocity squared. So if I'm moving 70 miles an hour, it's a lot of energy, right? If I hit a wall, what's gonna happen? All of that energy is gonna go into all the pieces that are gonna fly all over the place and into my head and my body that gets ripped apart and all that kind of stuff, right? So basically, the energy that you have at any given time, that same energy is in that system the next instant. It just might be going somewhere else, right? The example I give electrically, take a hairdryer, right? Say the hairdryer is running. Hairdryer draws a lot of current, okay? If you just take a hairdryer and you yank it out of the wall without turning it off, what happens? You get a big spark, right? Because what's happening is basically there's energy stored in the inductances and in those wires and things like that. So there's a one half Li squared, all right? So as soon as you pull that out, that energy has got to go somewhere. So basically it becomes heat and light, all right? So it's energy is always converted. Basically what this means is that the energy at time T minus and T plus is always the same. In other words, in my circuit, the energy right before is zero minus and zero plus. So in other words, right before time T equal to zero and right after time T equal to zero, always the same, okay? That's going to be useful to us all right, when we analyze these circuits, okay? Um, if, what would be the equivalent for a capacitor? Let's say I wanted to get a flash out of a capacitor. What would I do? Short it, all right? So don't try that, but you could. 
right? I charge up a capacitor and take a screwdriver across the terminals, I'll get a big flash, all right? Just the inductor, you've probably seen that one before. The hair dryer is the classic case, all right? Um, but but uh, you'll do the same thing with the with the capacitor. Okay. All right. So basically, this this is the important thing. Inductor current is always continuous as a function of time. Capacitor voltage is always continuous as a function of time. All right. And we're going to use those results. All right. And we're going to use them here in our examples. All right. Um, so we I, I'm not going to focus too much on this, but basically, every time we deal with these circuits. Right, um, inductors are short circuits in steady state. Capacitors are open circuits in steady state. All right, and the inductor current's always continuous. The capacitor voltage is always continuous. Okay, we're going to deal with those things. Now, and when we want to understand what's going on in the transient condition, we're going to always get a differential equation that is going to be first order, and it's going to look like that. All right, now, I wrote this guy saying there's a constant equals x plus tau times dx by dt. What's x? x is the thing I'm solving for. What's that going to be in any of the circuits that I give you? It's going to be a capacitor voltage or it's going to be inductor current, okay? No matter what the circuit looks like, no matter how complicated the circuit is, it's always going to look like that, okay? Always going to look like that, all right? And our solution is always going to look like this. It's going to say that whatever I'm solving for, x of t, so in other words, the capacitor voltage over time, the inductor current over time, is going to be equal to some final value plus a e to the s t, where s is always going to be what? I'm looking at that thing. What would s always end up being equal to? Close. s is always going to end up being negative 1 over the time constant. Okay. Always negative one over the, or sorry, S is always equal to negative one over the time constant, always, okay? So our job usually is really just to figure out what's the time constant, all right? So what's the time constant look like if I have um, an RC circuit? RC, what's it like if I have an LR circuit? L over R. L over R, yeah. People don't usually remember that one as much. Okay. All right. Yeah, there's two types of time constants. It's usually L over R or it's RC. Okay. So we'll, we'll deal with that. Okay. So what this means is I got to figure out what the final value is going to be. So that's basically, in other words, what's the steady state value of the current on the inductor? What's the steady state value of the voltage on the capacitor? And I got to figure out what that tau is going to be. Okay. All right. And so we get a solution that looks like this. All right. Our job is really going to be to find that final value and to find the transient solution. Now, the thing that we never know right off the bat is this little undefined value A that I wrote here, right? So you guys know from differential equations, A, E to the S, T, you always have one unknown, right? How do I solve for that unknown in differential equations? I'm hitting you right hard on the first day, right? Yeah. Find the initial condition. Find the initial condition. Okay. So you use the initial condition to solve for that unknown value. Okay. All right. So that basically gives me, and I and I, all my problems I try to lay out in this kind of six step process, right? So basically what I do is I try to figure out what's the initial value of the capacitor voltage or inductor current at zero minus. Right? So in other words, before any of these circuits, right? So when I say zero minus any of these circuits, what happens is there's always switches, right? And at time t equal to zero, the switches move, right? So basically I'm saying t equals zero minus is right before I do something with the switch. Zero plus is right after I do something with the switch, okay? We can solve for the right before time. And because the voltages and currents have to be continuous, right? If I solve for the value of the capacitor voltage or inductor current at zero minus, the value of zero plus has to be the same. Okay. All right. We're going to use that to get the initial conditions. Okay. Second step is to figure out the final value of the capacitor voltage or inductor current. And the way I do that is how? What do I do to figure out the final values, the steady state values? 
I guess I'll use those interchangeably, final and steady state. How do I always, what do I do? I guess I wrote it here, right? I, I assume that the capacitors become opens, the inductors become shorts, okay? All right, then I gotta do your favorite thing, which is to create Thevenin or Norton equivalent circuits. All right, what the heck is a Thevenin equivalent circuit? You guys remember that? Yeah, so what do I simplify it into? One source and one resistor. One voltage source and one resistor. It's an incredibly useful thing, right? They, they just kind of throw it in there. But basically, if you think about it, right? If if I looked into electrically to try to, to give me a circuit model for the other side of that wall socket, that wall socket has the entire North American power grid on the other side of it, right? That's a very complicated circuit, right? But I can simplify it down to a voltage source in series with a single impedance. And I just used the term I shouldn't use. A voltage source in series with a single resistance. We call it that. All right. So that's a Thevenin equivalent circuit. That Thevenin theorem is really useful to me. So we're gonna we're gonna apply that a lot. What's a Norton equivalent? Current in parallel with the yeah, current current source in parallel with the impedance, voltage resistance. So I'm jumping ahead. We're gonna use impedance that term a lot later. All right. Um then we're going to write a differential equation, and we're going to solve it, and then we're going to find all the unknowns. Six steps, okay? So what best place to learn than to go through an example, okay? So here's an example. And I write, it's a typical Cox problem. This is the type of problem I would give you typically. All right, switches um, and stuff, some sources. I like this problem because it's going to, this problem is going to be a good review of stuff from circuits one that I expect you know, all right? Two things I've, which I've already said. Right, one of them is Thevenin's, one of them is Norton's. That exam next Friday, one of those two things, maybe both, will be on the exam. All right, we're all expected to use Thevenin's theorem or Norton's theorem. Okay, so again, start thinking about that in 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 terms of your preparations. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and try to solve this guy. Ultimately, I want to figure out what's what's the inductor current going to look like over time. All right, but I wrote it out in terms of those six steps. Right, so the first step here is I say. What is the current IL of zero minus? In other words, what's the current through the inductor immediately before the switch moves? Okay. All right, immediately before the switch moves. Now, the other thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna close this. I put this in as an example problem so we could walk through how I do it in MATLAB. So on the assignments tab here, I'm going to go to this. I did this in class example, and you can see your homework's there ready to be published, but not published yet. All right. So if I click on this problem, it takes me over to the MATLAB grader. And we're going to do, we're going to do another example like this. We're probably not going to finish this one today, but we're going to start it. We'll pick up with it on Wednesday. Uh, and it takes a little while to post. Okay. I'm going to try to put this into the, the view that you guys would see. The program that we have to download. And it's just in the it's in the Canvas browser. So basically what you guys will see anytime you go in to solve one of these things is it'll look like this to you. Basically, here's the problem. And and I'll post a PDF with the problems too. There's no reason why you shouldn't be able to just sit there and solve the problems by hand. The reason I like this MATLAB system is because you're either right or you're wrong, right? Um, you don't have to wait weeks to get your homework back or whatever it's just you, you get your answers right off the bat um it does mean that you're using a tool that you're not familiar with right so but but it's pretty straightforward if i look at if i look at the way this guy is set up <clears throat> down here there's basically a set of what says assessments and then basically there's a set of variables that it's looking for to solve okay so the first thing it says is i want to figure out il of zero minus so in this case that is it's written here as il underscore zero all right, so I want to figure out what is the current in the inductor before t equal to zero, okay? All right, so let's look at the circuit. All right, where do I start with this? What's the first thing I want to do? First of all, 
if if I'm saying right before t equals the assumption we're always going to make with these problems, okay, is what? Is that everything's been, that switch has been that way for a long time, okay? So that switch has been that way for a long time. This guy got to a steady state, okay? This guy got to a steady state. What's true about my inductor? It's a short, okay? It's a short circuit. If, it, if I'm in steady state, the inductor can be replaced by a short circuit. So that means that my circuit, I'm going to redraw it. And it's going to look like this. I got my 2K resistor over here. I got a short circuit there. What do I do with that next branch? With the 12 volt source. So zero minus is before the switch opens, right? So that means the switch is closed because this is saying at t equal to zero, that switch is opening. That's what the arrow means there is that this guy's opening up t equal to zero, okay? So what would I do with that branch for the zero minus condition? Zero minus is before the switch opens. So it's, yeah, basically I don't even need to draw the switch. I put a 2K resistor in there again. I put my 12 volt source. And then I have, oops, I got a 3K resistor. And I got a six volt source like that, all right? Now, one important thing is I see I of T is written going down. I can't change that, all right? I can't change the direction. I gotta keep it whatever is defined in this problem, okay? Once I choose my directions in a problem, I don't ever change them again, all right? I choose them and I'm stuck with them. The only way you can be wrong is if you change your mind halfway through, okay? All right. The current in that branch in this circuit, that's IL of zero minus. Now, how am I going to do that? I want to use superposition. You guys are looking at this all I'm going to do master node. I, I want to use superposition just because I, I want to. I want to I want to make sure you guys are familiar with all the different methods. If I do superposition, how do I do superposition? One source at a time. One source at a time. <clears throat> all right. So the first source that I want to turn off, I want to turn off that six volt source. Okay, so if I turn off the six volt source, what's the circuit look like? Like this, it's gonna be a circuit. If I turn off the six volt source, basically what I have is um, I'm gonna have my two K resistor, my short circuit. The circuit. What's that? The circuit. What's open circuit? Uh, so if I have a voltage source and I turn a, turn off a voltage source, that means set its voltage to zero. If I set the voltage on a voltage source to zero, what's it become? Short circuit, short circuit, okay. Okay. One thing I'm gonna talk a lot in terms of is like the way I just answered your question, right? Where I basically said, if I think about a voltage source, turning a voltage source, that means that basically something, if I set the voltage on a voltage source to zero, uh -oh. if I set that voltage equal to zero, that means that it becomes a zero volt source. That means it's a short circuit. I'm going to think in those terms because you guys try to remember situations, but just we, we try to remember the generalities as much as we can. So we go through here. Okay. So I got this circuit. Now, the current in this branch is not IL of zero minus, but it's the current that's coming from the 12 volt source, okay? It's the current from the 12 volt source. So I'm gonna call this I1, I guess, all right? What is that current gonna be? How do I solve for that? How do I solve for that? What's that? Well, so we we could start doing what's what are the approaches we could use to start solving this guy? We could do mesh analysis, we could do nodal analysis. Which one of those? Which one you got a hand up and you're doing this? 
two pin and three pin is going to go away because it's only going to try to go through that one. What's okay? So right now, what's the if I look at this? If I did a KVL around this loop right here, right? What's the voltage across that two K resistor? Zero, right? I got zero volts across that resistor, right? So I got a short circuit across a 2K resistor. So if I have zero volts across the resistor, what's Ohm's law telling me the current has to be? Zero. zero, all right? So that tells me that the 2K and the 3K, because the 3K over here is also in parallel with that short circuit, right? That those basically, as far as I'm concerned, disappear from the circuit. Okay, so there's 12 volts, here's 2K, here's I1, like that, right? <clears throat> the reason they disappeared from the circuit is because the voltage across the 2K and the voltage across the 3K is equal to zero. KVL tells me that. If I do a KVL around the loop that includes the short and the 2K, or between around the loop that includes the short and the 3K, there's zero voltage across both of those resistors, okay? All right, so... From this, I can see that, what is that I1 gonna be, all right? Um, what is that I1 gonna be? Well, let's let's be careful about this here, right? Um, it will be six milliamps, you're right, but the thing I'm gonna pay close attention to, if I don't know any better, for me, I would write this out and I would say zero equals, um, I'm, I try to be careful with this here, guy, and, and I basically say, I go around here, I do my KVL, all right? And I would say zero equals, I would write everything out, all right? Given the time I have left, I'm not going to be able to do that here today, but it's going to be basically 12 volts equals I1 times the two kilo ohms, like that. And I1 will end up being 12 divided by 2,000 which if I do that math is gonna end up equal to six milliamps. Okay. Now, that's only half of it, okay? So given the time I've got left, I'm probably not gonna be able to do this here fully today. But if I go into Canvas, to the way that I would solve that problem here, IL of zero minus, I only did part of it, but I know part of it is gonna be 12 divided by uh, 2000 like that is how I would write that in there now there's another part of it right because I'm doing superposition I've only done one of the two sources so far I gotta do the other source you guys with me through that point okay all right now we'll do the rest of this I think we end at 110 right and it's 107 now how would I approach let's at least set it up for the six volt source okay so for the six volt source Again, I have the 2K here. The inductor is a short. I'm gonna call this current now I2, okay? So in general, I'm gonna say IL of zero minus is equal to whatever I solved on the previous page for I1 plus whatever I'm solving here for I2 since I'm doing superposition, okay? I1 is from the 12 volt source, I2 is from the six volt source, all right? What do I do? Now, I turn off the 12 volt source. If I turn off the 12 volt source, what do I replace it with? The short, yeah. It's gonna be a 2K here. And then I leave the six volt source on like that. And here's my 3K like that. Now, <clears throat> what do I know about those two 2K resistors again? Yeah, there's no current through those guys, right? Because I know the voltage across the two Ks, both of them, the voltage across both of them is zero, right? So in other words, this circuit simplifies itself down to, don't rush to oversimplify things too quickly. Just make sure you understand the basic setup, okay? Here's I2, here's the three K, and here's the six volts, okay? Now, if I wanna figure out what I2 is gonna be, okay? What I'm gonna do with this is, as I'm gonna write, write it out pretty carefully, and I've got two minutes, I'm gonna to try to do that, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, 
that this guy, I'm going to call this, I don't know, call that V3 because it's a 3K resistor. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the way, the way that I do this is I would say, I'm going to write out KVL, zero equals, and I move always in a, uh, was that clockwise direction? Okay. So I'm going to say zero equals negative V3, negative six. Okay. Because what I did was I went from minus to plus, minus to plus. All right. So that goes minus V3, minus six, like that. Okay. Now, what's V3 equal to here? In terms of the currents and voltages, I would say V3 equals 3,000 times negative I2. Why did I write it like that? Why did I say V3 is equal to 3,000 times negative I2? Is there a distance? Well, yeah, it's a 3K resistor. But what's true about that what, About that arrow? And plus. Plus. Yeah, the arrow's coming out of the plus sign. Right? The arrow's coming out of the plus, not into the plus. And I get a negative sign in there. So that says that I write this KVL as 0 equals negative V3, right? I plug in my V3 and this guy becomes 3000 times I2 minus six, like that. You guys with me? Okay. All right, so we got more to, to and I can solve for my I2. I plug in my I2 and I, and I pop that into that MATLAB thing and I keep going. Now we got more steps to do, right? But we, we ran out of time for today, right? So we'll do this. We'll do the rest of this on Wednesday, okay? All right, I'll stop there. If you guys have questions, you can come on up. I post them afterwards, yeah.